It's uh, now my great pleasure to introduce myself to the stage. <laughs> so uh, uh, Sandeep Gupta asked me to give a talk about my book, but a little bit, since the title is Market Versus Medicine, America's Epic Fight for Better Affordable Health Care, the word America is in there in fairly uh, uh, broad detail, to give it a little bit more of an international flavor, like our lunch. You know, we had a Waldorf salad from New York, we had garlic bread and pasta from Italy, and then some dal and rice from, uh, from India. So I'm gonna do my best to make my book about American healthcare uh, international. So I thought I'd first tell you a little bit about the writing of the book and the structure, uh, then discuss international models, and then talk specifically about two decentralized models, the United States and India. So I mentioned earlier during the uh, debate that when I um, talk to audiences in America about, about health care, I, I ask uh, the question, um, do we need to spend more than 18% of our economy to provide uh, health care to everyone in the country? Uh, I, when I do that, I ask two other questions as well. And by the way, nobody has ever raised their hand and said we need to spend more than 18% of our economy. So the second question is, uh, Chronic disease of various forms consumes about 80% of the healthcare spend in the United States. How many think we're winning the war against chronic disease? And again, no one raises their hand. So given no answers to those first two questions, uh, the third question I ask is, on a relative basis, how many believe we need to shift resources out of acute and specialty care into chronic disease management, behavioral health, health promotion, and primary care. And every hand in the audience goes up. So what's really interesting, it's not the what to do, it's the how to do it uh, that's the challenge for America. And I would argue the challenge um, for any country that's trying to uh, overhaul its healthcare system. How to get the right balance between prevention and treatment. Uh, how to have the focus on wellness and healthy communities while providing access to vital treatments when they're necessary. So it was really to try to answer those three questions that um, I, I, I wrote the book. Um, and it's, it's funny, the more I got into it, the more it reminded me of Star Wars. Now that Disney bought Star Wars, there's a Star Wars movie every year, but the one in 2015 was called The Force Awakens. And uh, I, I, I like to think of uh, my book, if you want another title, it's The Market Force Awakens. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have what society wants, American society, I would say world society, which is better health care, affordable health care, more convenient health care, more compassionate health care, and it's up against this medical empire, think of Darth Vader, uh, big hospitals, big insurance, big medical device firms, big pharmaceutical firms, all of whom are doing very well under the current system and pretty much trying to keep it intact. And the heroes of the story are companies old and new, big and small, real innovators that, are, that meet the empire in the marketplace and really try to deliver on the promise of better health care at lower prices, better outcomes at lower prices, better customer service. And it's early days, uh, but they're scrappy and they're agile and they're making real progress in terms of, of redefining how healthcare delivery will be. In fact, we just saw a great example with telemedicine. Um, so the book itself has uh, four sections, the four A's, assess, align, adapt, and advance. Uh, assess is basically until you define a problem, you can't talk about its solution. Align and adapt are most important for this section on innovation. Align deals with uh, sustaining innovation. How do we make the system better at what it's supposed to do? Less variation in treatment outcomes, better customer service, lower costs. How do we get it to be better at what it's supposed to do? Adapt is more of the disruptive innovation. Uh, we're moving to entirely different payment models away from fee-for-service activity-based payment to various types of value-based payment, the most aggressive of which is we just pay a certain amount per month, per member per month, 
to insurance companies, integrated development companies, um, to take care of that group of people. They, at that point, own all of the health care risk of, of that person, and that aligns with uh, the needs of their, their members. So unless they take advantage of preventative health care and keep people out of the hospitals, their costs will be greater than the premiums coming in. So that's, that's the direction we're moving in. And then the advanced section uh, really was, was born out of a, uh, uh, an experience I had in Salt Lake City. Uh, I was walking back, or I was going back to Chicago from, from Salt Lake City and in the airport, and I was waiting in the security line, and there was a, a very young woman, not even 30, in front of me, who must have weighed over 300 pounds, and she was wheeling an um, oxygen container. And it took her a long time to get through security. She had to unhook the oxygen container. Uh, she didn't fit front ways through, so she had to turn sideways, shuffle through the uh, security gate, uh, and then reassemble everything. And I had two thoughts uh, while I was watching this unfold. The first was I just felt very badly for her that to be that young and that compromised in her life, um, not, be able, not being able to enjoy everything that life has to offer. But the second thought was, was more global, which was people like this didn't really exist 30 years ago, and what is it about our society and our culture that's a, a, enabled or allowed large numbers of these types of people to emerge? So the last section of the book really tries to address that question, and then what, what do we do about it? Um, and then, you know, I was an investment banker most of my life, and, uh, you know, at some point I said, well, why am I the one writing this book about how to fix healthcare in America? And <laughs> yeah, still a good question, by the way. Um, so, but Steve Jobs uh, of Apple fame uh, gave a very uh, interesting commencement address at Stanford in 2011, where he said the dots in life connect in retrospect. And the example he used was, um, his experience when he dropped out of college, he happened to drop into a calligraphy class because he was interested in calligraphy and he learned all about fonts and the way to draw them, the different depths and sizes and, and so on. And fast forward 10 years, uh, he's putting together the Apple operating system and that's why we ended up with all these great fonts, sans serif and so on. And then Microsoft ripped off Apple and so everybody's got ac access to them. Um, so for me, uh, I was trying to think about it. I said, well, my background's a little strange. I was a literature major in college, and then I was a Peace Corps volunteer teaching language arts and also a soccer coach in, in West Africa. Came back and went to uh, public policy school at Harvard thinking that I was going to do international development, discovered I liked finance, and after some back and forth, ended up being a healthcare investment banker. And what that allows me to do is look at healthcare, which is a very complex industry from any one of these different perspectives. And I really have come to the conclusion you need uh, literary sensibility, cultural uh, sensitivity, public policy acumen, and market knowledge to really have a broad understanding of what happens in healthcare. So part of what I'm able to bring to the discussion is the ability to look at it from these four different lenses. So healthcare, and we've had great examples. It, it, the national model is basically about delivering healthcare and then paying for it. And different countries uh, come up with different ways of doing that. And it, this is a very simple grid, but it's got uh, providers, hospitals and doctors, insurance and coverage, and then an example uh, as you go across. And we start with socialized medicine and uh, the beverage model, uh, which is uh, the state owns hospitals and doctors, um, the, 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 or it doesn't, it owns the hospitals, employs the doctors. Maybe they feel like they're owned some days. Uh, it provides all the insurance, and it has universal coverage, and, and people in Great Britain don't even receive a bill. Uh, it, that's, it's true socialized medicine. Um, Single-payer systems, which exist in a number of countries. Uh, the providers, hospitals, and doctors are private. Uh, but the insurance itself is, is public, and it, again, is universal. And then you have global 
uh, budget systems uh, like the Bismarck model in Germany, where you've got private uh, hospitals and doctor private insurance companies, but they operate under a global budget uh, to keep both sides in check. And again, universal coverage. So all of those are examples of centralized models. And uh, you know, you heard my description of, of um, uh, the flaws of, of uh, kind of centralized uh, economic models, state-run systems. They, they have a, a much more difficult time optimiz optimizing resource utilization. So then we have these other two models, uh, which underperform uh, relative to the universal models, but in many ways have more potential uh, to break out of some of the, the challenges we currently have. Uh, I've called the United States uh, uh, selected budgets. So we pay for health care uh, from many different pools. Some of it is at the federal level, some of it is at the state government level. Uh, employers cover much of the health care costs for people in the country. And then there's a fair amount of direct out-of-pocket costs. So it's, it's private, um, private hospitals and doctors by and large. Um, the insurance is a mix of public and private. The coverage is targeted. And while uh, it's, it's tightened up under Obamacare, we still have about 20 million people without access to health insurance. And then finally, the cash-based system uh, where hospitals and doctors are private um, there's no insurance company, there's no coverage, it's basically pay as you go. Um, and India, as we've talked about a couple of times, is, is very close, uh, or is, is a good example of that, or as close as we get to that. So none of these systems is perfect. They all struggle with cost and access pressures, uh, and then how to manage the demand. Um, one thing about healthcare is people will consume as much of it as you allow them. So how to keep that in check, uh, very, very difficult. So in the, the United States system, um, <laughs> Walter Cronkite's neither healthy caring nor a system, and it has artificial economics, and it has these other things going for it too, which, uh, which I, you can read, but I, I won't go over. Um, but look at this, it's, it's, uh, this measures um, mortality, against average discharge cost at Mass General Hospital, one of the great hospitals in the United States, from 1821 or 1822 uh, to 2010. And you can see, uh, as medicine improved, mortality came down. And then about 1965, uh, the cost just started skyrocketing. Um, and that really relates to the creation of Medicare and its two original sins, which were to pay for um, activity, uh, not for outcomes, and to allow no medical interference in medical decision making, or no governmental interference in medical decision making. So as a result, our supply creates its own demand. Literally, the best predictor of cardiology procedures in any market is the number of cardiologists in that market. Um, no other country quite does it like the United States. We're, we're exceptional in that way, which is why we can spend 18 percent of our economy um, and have, deliver subpar outcomes. But we're starting to disrupt, and the areas where you're going to see the disruption occur are, are focus factories, in, enhanced primary care, where they actually do a much better job of taking care of large groups of people, uh, the big retail clinics and asset light providers. Uh, I, I, I won't go into those. Um, but the focus factory is, is one that um, India should be very very aware of because companies like the Aravind Eye, Eye Care and Nariana Health are epitomes of focus factories. Um, but let me just spend a moment about the, how the disruption is going to occur. And I call this Amazoning healthcare. Uh, what Amazon did to publishing, which was they basically decided the only people that were important were the writer and the reader, and they disrupted everything else in the middle, the, the publishers, the distributors, and the bookstores, and they've basically all gone away. We're starting to see some of those same kinds of pressures uh, on healthcare, where at the end of the day, the caregivers and the patients or the customers are really what's most important in the system, and then how they're paid as we go to market-based payment, um, 
these third-party administrators that take 15% off the top when they probably should get about 3%, and then the high-cost staffing models which have built up in response to this uh, fee-for-service system, all of those are under enormous pressure. And as companies and customers begin to focus in on transparency and real costs, it bends, it bends the market uh, toward value. Um, and then one last slide here, um, just about India. Um, and I look at India as uh, what economists call a natural experiment with market-based health care. Because so much is paid out of pocket, um, Indian health care providers have to uh, pay attention to what consumers want. Pricing and access go together. The lower the price, the greater the access. Incredible market segmentation. Uh, some of the nicest hospitals in the world, I'm on the board of Mananta, the Medicity, and th that competes with any facility in the world. Um, but then also these really interesting high volume, low cost uh, providers like Arvind and Narayana, uh, a very robust alternative medicine segment. Uh, Dr. Trehan, who started Medanta, likes to say that Western medicine is outside in, Eastern medicine is inside out, and that the best system would combine the two in an evidence-based way. And I think by that he means Western medicine is invasive and reductionist, Eastern medicine is holistic and integrative. And if we were able to blend the two together, we really could come up with superior care models. I mean, there's so much we don't understand in healthcare. The placebo effect, uh, spontaneous er uh, uh, remissions, mind-body connectivity. Uh, and India is the most uh, remarkable place to, uh, to test those. And finally, in all countries, you deal with moral hazard, uh, people getting health care they don't need that someone else pays for an unmet need. India, despite what was said earlier, I think has very low moral hazard. Uh, the U.S., we waste about a third of the health care budget. That's a trillion dollars. I once tried to figure out how long you had to live, how many years you had to live to live a trillion seconds, and the answer is 32,000. So you can imagine each year <laughs> we waste 32,000 years of se uh, seconds of, 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 of need. So um, with that, I'm going to wrap up uh, this section on the book, but it all comes down to, and I've actually uh, trademarked this, outcomes matter, customers count, value rules. If your health system is focused on those three things, or if you're in a company that is in the health system, you're doing these things, you're going to be okay. Uh, and with that, I will invite...